want to share this thing with you because we uh, haven't announced it yet. But every year, we like to put out these business-sized cards for you to take. And the idea is when you are out getting coffee or at the drive through to pay, if you're able, to pay for the person behind you and leave them this card. Here's what it says. On the front, it says, Merry Christmas. And on the back, it says, We believe the greatest gift that God gave the world was Jesus. Please accept this gift as a small expression of God's love for you from your friends at Tower Hill Church. So it's a way of sharing some generosity this holiday season. If you're into that, this is your thing, grab some. They're at the guest services desk. You can take as many as you like. We could always order more. As, uh, you know, the thing that I've noticed, especially since the pandemic, is I am always amazed at the speed at which the lights go up in our community. I mean, it's gotten faster and faster. I'm, uh, I'm really amazed by this because it's like Thanksgiving, and it's Thanksgiving, like my neighbors have their lights up. I'm like, when did you even do this? I thought we had some time here. And then I'm feeling all this pressure. It's kind of like uh, our good friends who uh, they had Christmas cards the day after. <laughs> they know who they are. I joked with them about that. Christmas cards the day after Thanksgiving. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such an underachiever. What am I doing with my life? But I definitely, and maybe you've noticed this even since COVID, is they're going up earlier. I mean, I, I saw lights before Thanksgiving. I mean, it's just like everyone's dying to have some feel good. And with everything going on in the world, it's no wonder, right? We all have a little bit of Clark Griswold going on right now because we're just aching for something positive, something fun, something joyful, something to distract us from what's going on in this world and in our lives. Today, we're going to be talking about the difference that hope makes in the Christian life. Because we all need a little Christmas, right? We need some feel good. Santa! I've, the best was, uh, was last night where the kids seeing Santa Claus. That was so great. Man, they were jacked up. It also helped that we cranked them full of sugar. But they were, they were so jacked up to see Santa. And I don't know about you, but I mean, certainly we're so tired of, of the anxiety and the fear and the brokenness and the depression. It's like, give me a good Christmas movie and like some hot chocolate. Let me just escape. Maybe that's what it is more than anything. It's a little bit of an escape from the day-to-day -day pressure that maybe we feel. But hope or lack of hope has a huge impact on how we live our lives right now. Whatever you think about the future, if you're ho hopeful or not hopeful, it changes how you live now. There's a, a great story about this. Uh, Alfred Luckick in his book, Unfinished Business, was talking about this story about a town. True story, that the town was to be flooded as part of a large lake for which a dam was being built. In the months before it was to be flooded, all improvements and repairs in the whole town were stopped. What was, the, what was the use of painting a house if it were to be covered with water in six months? Why repair anything when the whole village was to be wiped out? So, week by week, the whole town became more and more bedraggled, more gone to seed, more woe begone. Then he added, by the way of explanation, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. This rings true to me. Where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. Advent is about faith in the future so that we live with power in the present, power right now. Hope changes things. It changes how we live. And so Advent, this season that we're in, speaks to a future hope, and that changes everything. The word comes from a Latin word that means coming or arrival. And I think it's, we are the people of Advent. So we celebrate Advent. And some of you, you know, you got Advent calendars. You're saying counting down. And the whole idea is you're waiting on Jesus to show up. And of course, we celebrate that he did. He was born. He came. He came and he did what he did on the cross to save us all. But we as Christians, we're also looking forward. We're like between two Advents. We're looking forward to when he comes back. And the whole world is groaning and breaking and waiting for that day that he comes back and makes all things new. We live in between the Advents. 
But then there's the million mini advents that we all experience every day. We're waiting on Jesus to show up somewhere in our lives. We are waiting for God to show up. Maybe it's in our relationships, or maybe it's in our finances, or maybe we retired and we're like, dang, the money's thinning out here. How are we going to keep going on this fixed income? Or maybe some of you, somebody has a broken relationship. Maybe it's with a spouse. Maybe it's with a kid or a grandkid. Maybe it's at work. You're waiting for Jesus to show up. And so I think we need to be good at trusting that he's going to show up. This is what Advent helps to teach us. If we're, if we're good at it, if we learn how to trust, it gives us power in the present because we have hope for the future. And hope changes everything. Not all churches talk a lot about Advent. That's one of the benefits of coming from a church that has a more traditional past, is that that's something that we hold on to. And I like it because Advent is the way that one of, one of my favorite commentaries talks about it. So the stories of Advent are dug from the harsh soil of human struggle. Like, what's it like to have faith? What's it like to have faith and to live it in the messiness of everyday life? That's where Advent speaks to us, in the mess. And trusting that God, through it all, is going to show up. Because hope has a huge impact on how we live our lives. Now listen, Christmas is great. Believe me, I love me some Christmas. I I love all the things. But I think in some ways, Christmas is more of a distraction or or an escape than an actual remedy to what's going on in us. What do we mean when we talk about, not just hope, but what do we mean when we talk about Christian hope? That's the difference. So in a sermon about hope, I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about the Las Vegas Raiders. (laughs) That's my boy Max with two X's, so you know he's cool. Max Crosby. Um, anyway, so the Raiders, I read in the New York Times, sitting pretty right where they want to be at 5 and 7. <laughs> the Raiders currently have a 1% chance to make the playoffs. So I read this article, and here's, here was my reaction. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but what's that hope really based on? That's, uh, that's actually, honestly, it's false hope. I, That's just wishful thinking. That's not based on any sort of evidence or fact. It's just based on something that I want to see happen. How is Christian hope different than that? Christian hope is different because it's actually based on something. It's based on previous experience with God so I can trust that he's going to show up in the future. Christian hope is based on what God has already done. Listen. Hope is based on trust. And I've shared with these, this you before that when I was growing up, I was always last to get picked up. And I, it's not an exaggeration. My mom was always last to get me, like after practice. And it wasn't like you had the cell phone. You had to find a pay phone. And who wants to do that and do the fake collect calls so that they pick up? And some of you, you know what I'm talking about. Others, you're like, what's a pay phone? <laughs> so, so I would wait and she would show up. But here's the thing. I never once thought she wasn't going to show up. Why? Because she always did. I had this whole past experience with my mom saying, she was going to be late, so we're going to show up on time. But she was going to show up every time. So I never panicked. I just got annoyed. What is hope? Hope is based on trust. And trust is based on prior actions. So what is Advent? Advent is about increasing our trust in Jesus by remembering what he has done. That he's going to show up. He may not be on your time, but he's going to show up every time. And when you live with that kind of confidence, that kind of hope, it changes how you live. It changes everything about it. This is how Romans says it, Romans 15, 4. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. 
So what do we learn about Christian hope? There's a couple of things I want to share with you today. The first is, and I think this is the obvious, that prophets are the proof it's not false hope. Think about Jesus himself. Jesus prophesied that he would die and be raised in three days. Anybody who like does that and gets it right, I'm going to listen to what they have to say. The prophecy coming true is the proof. The prophets in the Old Testament are the proof that we can trust that God's going to show up. Why? Because he did. And he's going to keep showing up. He's going to show up today and tomorrow and the next day. And one day he's going to show up in such a way that all things are made new. New creation, new heaven and earth, new everything. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more sin. All made new in the glory of God's kingdom. That's Christian hope. I may be going through it right now. I may have this issue where I'm just waiting on Jesus, but he's coming. Maybe not on my time, but he's coming every time. So what do we learn from the prophets? A few things. Here's just a couple. So the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied back about 700 years before Jesus, which is (laughs) so hard to get my head around. 700 years. I feel like 20 years is a long time. 700 years. The things that are said by the prophet Isaiah and coming true in Jesus Christ is really remarkable. In fact, if you ever read Isaiah chapter 53, it spells out exactly what Jesus does on the cross 700 years later. It's incredible. But the prophet's the proof. So he he worked, there are two kingdoms. This is the time of the two kingdoms. Go back one. Time of the two kingdoms where uh, you had the kingdom of Israel in the north, in the kingdom of Judah in the south. And both were getting it wrong. I'm, I'm going to summarize. It's not exactly how Isaiah put it, but God's just like, you're messing up. Turn around. Come back to me. You're going to pay a price. Come back to me. Stop running away from me. Stop doing all these things you know you're not supposed to be doing. Come back to me or you're going to get conquered and you're going to be thrust into darkness and you're going to hate it. Isaiah keeps telling and telling and telling and they don't listen And they do end up getting conquered by the Assyrian Empire. And yet, here's the thing about God that a lot of people are like, oh, the Old Testament's like, God's so angry. And I'm like, you would be too. But it's not just anger. I see so much grace in the Old Testament. Even though they're conquered by the Assyrian Empire, Isaiah's next words weren't like, told you so. You made your bed, now sleep. No, it's something like a parent, man. He doesn't say that. He says, therefore, here's in chapter 7, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Even he gets very specific. Even in chapter 8, he talks about in the northern kingdom, these two cities, Naphtali and Zebulun, which interestingly are, are right near Galilee. That's the Sea of Galilee, right near Galilee. In the northern kingdom, in uh, chapter 8, he says they will be thrust into utter darkness, these two cities. That, and uh, scholars believe that they thought very highly of these two cities. Like, you're not going to be able to conquer these cities. They're too great. And, and they are conquered, thrust into utter darkness. Now watch this. After that, he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, yeah, you blew it. You're in a darkness of your own making, and some of you can relate to that right now. Actually, all of us can relate to that. We end up in darkness of our own making, and God doesn't say, well, I told you so. Sorry. Sorry, not sorry. He doesn't say that at all. He says, nevertheless, nevertheless, I'm going to get you out of there. I'm going to bring light into the darkness. Nevertheless, there'll be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness, back one, walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. What an incredible promise. God's going to show up. Hang on. Hang on through the darkness. He will show up. Even though you put yourself there, he's still going to show up. You look at Jeremiah, the other prophet I want to talk about today. He was a prophet of the southern kingdom. They were going the same way as the northern kingdom. You think they would have learned their lesson. They didn't. God's like, turn around, turn around, turn around. They don't. They get conquered by the Babylonians. And hear Jeremiah's words to the people. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Hope and a future. Remember, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. He continues in chapter 33. The days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. The days are coming. This darkness isn't going to last forever. And what happens? God shows up. Jesus is born. Jesus begins to teach and preach. Jesus is arrested. Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus accomplishes the fulfillment of the promise. Jesus showed up. The prophets are the proof. It's not false hope. When we're trusting in Jesus, we know we can trust in Jesus because we've seen them do it before, not just through the pages of Scripture, but in our own lives' pages. We've seen how God's shown up before. He's going to show up again. This is the hope that we get from Christian hope. The second, God with us is a confirmation of that hope. He doesn't just be like, okay, you can have hope in me and I'll pick you up at the end of life. I am with you every step of the way. By the Holy Spirit, I am constantly with you. It's a confirmation of the hope. It's sort of like, listen, I'm definitely feeling that I am aging and, you know, some of you, you can relate to that. You're just like, how old are you? I got shoes older than you, you know what I'm saying? But you feel it, right? So I was speaking of Christmas lights, hanging Christmas lights yesterday. This morning, I'm sore. (laughs) I'm sore as if I had gone to the gym and lifted heavy weights. I am sore from hanging Christmas lights, which is ridiculous. But it is a confirmation of what I know to be true that I am aging. Thank you, God, for that one. Listen, we have confirmation of the hope promised to us because we can experience God every single day. We experience him with us now. God saying God with us isn't just, you know, some sort of feel-good statement or some sort of platitude. He is with us, profoundly with us. Emmanuel, profoundly with us. He is with us in this moment as we sit here and we hear his word. As we talk to the people around us, we are getting a confirmation of the hope within us. And you could feel it. You come to church and you could feel it. There's something going on. It's the Holy Spirit confirming the hope that he has promised to you. How is Christian hope different? It's not just a feeling, but a person. Our hope is Jesus Christ. We have hope we could always trust in because he has already done it. Here's the thing, and this is the important thing to remember. God may seem silent in your life, but he is not absent. He is with you. And he's probably been trying to speak to you. For anybody who's in, this, in a time where you feel like, I haven't heard from God, I feel really like I'm out of touch, I promise you God's not out of touch with you. Don't let your feelings deceive you. God is with you, always. Always. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's never going to leave or forsake you. He's never just going to say, well, you know, been, been a bad boy or girl, and I'm going to go find somebody worthy. He's with you even now. He wants you to experience the life he's created you to live, not just in the hereafter, but in the here and now. What do we learn from John 10.10? 10, I've come to give them life and that to the full. Jesus wants to give you the fullness of life now. 
God promises he's going to show up. Again, you may feel like he's late, but he's actually always on time. And then third, and this is related, we have hope because of what Jesus already did. He already did it. He already accomplished the promise. Listen, hope is based on trust. I once heard it said that if Christmas is the promise, Easter is the proof. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. And so whatever promise he has given to you, that he wants you to have life and that to the full, he is going to deliver it. He is able to do it because he's already done it. You just need to receive it. Which is a tricky thing because we get in our own way a lot whether it's because of sin or because of distraction or whatever it is. God's like, here, I'm giving this to you. We're just like, yeah, like, give me a minute. Super busy right now. Hope is tried. This is how Isaiah 53 puts it. He was pierced, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. In other words, even as we sin now, Jesus winces on the cross as he pays for that sin. He has done it. It is finished. You can have hope because it's done. It's completed. You just need to receive it and actually believe it and live your life like it's true. I had a seminary professor who used to say it was faith in three tenses. This is the hope of Advent, of Christian hope. So we trust, we see God's promises in the past fulfilled. So we can trust that he's going to fulfill his promises in the future. So we can live in power today. It changes everything when you know he's going to show up. No matter what you're going through. It changes everything. And this is what he wants for us, not just for us, so that the world can look at us and be like, wow, what are you doing? How do you have that kind of hope? How do you have that kind of trust? I'm floundering in the dark. You seem to have a light. And for that light to point to Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem of pain and sin brokenness in the world. And that's a tough one. And there are a lot of things that I could say on that, but that's for a different day. I will leave you with this, though. Just because God's promised it and delivered doesn't mean because of the sin-broken world, there still isn't suffering. And I wish I could give you like a complete, full and final answer about suffering. I can't. That's above my pay grade. Here's an idea that I really like. This is from C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain. He said, I suggest to you that it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. The gift of suffering. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It's usually pain that's trying to kill your hope. But what would your life look like if you had more hope in Jesus Christ? How would that change how you live today? If you increased your amount of hope in Jesus... What would increase in your life right now? Oh, I bet your life would be better. We've given away these Advent journals, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't grabbed one, to grab one. There's some wonderful exercises in there and some questions for you to think about. And the whole idea is as you grow into this, as you embrace the hope of the gospel, you start going in your life, you start, stop living maybe, Yeah, maybe things will get better. Maybe God's going to, maybe this into will be. No, no, no. God's going to show up because that's what he does. He arrives. He shows up every single time in my life. And that will change everything. Amen.